I would like to welcome you to the last panel uh, conversation of the conference. We made it. All right, um, so I would like to introduce you all to Roadmap to Data Standardization in Controlled Environment Agriculture. Um, and as a reminder for the conference, there will be a feedback survey that is going to be sent out um, after the conference. I highly encourage you guys to give feedback, whether it's good or things you want to see changed. Uh, the Interact Home team is very receptive to it, and they are always looking for ways to improve for the next year. So with that, the panel you Thanks and welcome for this uh, last hurrah in uh, two very interesting intense days. Thank you so much for attending this. Um, for many reasons, these kinds of topics um, around standardization tend to be kind of a boring topic. <laughs> so I want to make this more interesting uh, because it is a very interesting uh, development, of course, uh, to talk about. Don't want to use that word too much because it somewhat is also a uh, 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 rigid form of uh, organizing that. And we're kind of like a quirky, innovative, uh, interesting, emerging ecosystem. And I appreciate uh, that we have a fantastic, interesting, diverse group of panelists here. Uh, we'll start with a short introduction for Melanie. She can actually explain herself in the best way. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here and thank you for staying uh, to the good end of the conference. I'll be on my name is Melody Yelton and I'm a plant scientist and let's see, so I've always been a plant scientist. I did my training at UC Davis and then was a researcher and teacher at Stanford University for many, many years. And then I left about 10 or 12 years ago to enter this industry because I felt like it was almost analogous to the beginning of molecular biology, which I can actually remember. Um, so, you know, there's something exciting here happening, and um, I was in lighting, and worked on standardization associated with LED lighting, and then I moved on to Plenty, where I was director of plant science at Plenty for many years, and I started a company recently, the last year, called Grow Big, which is really more of a diverse um, consulting company to really help people navigate this industry, and not just this industry, but for farming, but I could see this continuum of growing and controlled environment in general. So that's, that's me. Thanks, Melanie. Um, yeah, go big. That's, that's a, an interesting uh, <laughs> opener also for, for discussion around uh, where we want to be in the future. Um, <clears throat> Kurt, you're uh, one of the few lawyers I know who ended up uh, operating in a greenhouse. Uh, how does that happen? I got saved. I, after I served my time as a lawyer. Uh, this is my second career of 10 years. Six of those years, uh, senior management as partner in, in building and then operating a 10 acre hydroponic facility in, in the central US. And I've been a consultant in the last year and a half to a wide variety of growers, technology companies, and some contractors. And I just wanted to say we were close during the day to having a bet to see whether there'd be more panel members than audience attendees. So thank you all. Made this uh, uh, what should be a plentiful experience. Thank you. Well, you we can add a little controversy there. I'm not sure. <laughs> so I really love this. Uh, next to me is uh, uh, Rick Scheiders from uh, Anshina. Um, please uh, oh, thank you for being here. Yeah, no, thank you all for being saying good night. Uh, my name is Rick Scheiders. Uh, indeed, uh, I'm a Work for Siemens, the German company. We're there now almost six years. I'm uh, heading the future food department in that board. Um, three years ago, Siemens started a confidence center actually for agriculture. So we saw there is a big need to, in general, for sustainable food production. So for us to learn was actually how can we drive, how can we support being a big industrial company, being active in more than 20 different markets. Uh, we saw that actually uh, there is a need to standardize it, to have the general industrial automation be more integrated into, into this field. And from there also we started to collaborate with companies like 80 Acres in the US and we learned a lot of their challenges. Uh, and I think one of the challenges that they have is that there is limited to no data available for them to optimize their farm. And 
that's actually how it started to, to scale and to also learn from many of different companies all over the world. How can we as a company, uh, as an industry, uh, help these growers, help these companies uh, reinventing new business models to uh, scale more faster? So that's actually uh, yeah, why I'm sitting here. Complex. Yes, exactly. Very complex. Yes, very complex. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, uh, you know, we, we, we had uh, uh, five years ago this epiphany as a group of uh, people uh, in both the US and in Europe who started an association called Complex Society with the idea primarily also to discuss this dilemma we're having in our sector. Number one, because it's a dilemma every grower has a little bit. That is that uh, you're, you're not sure what you're doing is actually working well. I mean, you're happy to survive the season, happy to grow something and actually go to market with it and, and earn a living, but it's a different matter of measuring the unit economics and, and the operational costs and the uh, capex equations and all these things. So agriculture is a very complex undertaking and uh, it is very old fashioned. No one transfer is not really organized well uh, in a kind of like an open domain. Transfer of knowledge from one generation to another. If you're a farmer, uh, if your father was a farmer and you take over the farm, you learn from him primarily, but not from anybody else, how to operate successfully a farm. Now we're in a kind of a different age now, with, for whatever reasons. I mean, there are many, many reasons to think that the, the way we farm is no longer working, and particularly in this segment, this niche segment of CDA, there's quite a lot of people who really think that we need to for change or update or upgrade the way we grow food. It's a lot of the motivation. At the same time, it also is a, a, a real interesting opener to people from other parts of uh, the world, you know, I, you know, from a professional point of view, to look into agriculture and think about how could we do this better? Because the effort in a combination or as uh, Tina Rolfos from Siemens, uh, Rolfos from Siemens said, it takes a village to raise a kid. So you really need to have a better understanding as a collective uh, and use the collective knowledge to, to uh, you know, solve these challenges. And we have very severe challenges, uh, namely the succession problems we have, the, the labor problems, the energy problems. It's just a perfect cake of, of challenges. And it's not getting any better. I mean, it doesn't look like it's, it's getting easier. It actually is getting harder. Now that is an interesting way to look at uh, from a point of controlled environment agriculture because a lot of our solutions actually address those problems in, in food production or food and fiber in many different ways. So um, setting the stage a little bit, I wanted to find out uh, also from you guys if there are opinions <coughs> up front for us to kind of uh, uh, learn from it. And we, we, we just encourage you to be very, very uh, uh, in raising the hand and asking questions or you know differ with our opinions. We have all different opinions about it. Um, <laughs> it's a it's 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 an interesting trajectory since five years we've managed to put forward some dialogue around this topic in, in an international setting but also within the communities which are regional, national, etc. And you know there's even organizations now like the CA Alliance who actually is produce this sort of, or is going to produce uh, some interesting guidelines on sustainability metrics. Uh, this uh, research innovation institute uh, who's also done similar work around water uh, use and benchmarking for energy uh, footprint, which is forthcoming too. And there's a bunch of other initiatives. Huh? But you know, the, the dilemma as we identified it is always that you know these are fragmented efforts, and these are not really answering the question. What I always raise is like how. How much of an incentive does the grower need to really see the value of sharing information to achieve a kind of like a harmonized data uh, uh, collection system, but also to agree on, on, on certain standards around food safety? Yeah. I mean, we don't we don't have any standards on how long you need to wash your hands when you work in, in an agricultural setting, but we could do that as a first step towards uh, controlled environment agriculture because you know that's one of the strengths that we. Anyway, I'm, I'm just going to uh, ask you guys to raise your hand if you think that this topic is essential for growing beyond that niche we have. Okay. I would say about 50%, but maybe a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, so 
everybody else thinks it's not. The fire. <laughs> so the good news is obviously that, that we have a divided audience because that's the best audience. It's the worst audience is if everybody agrees. And then we go home and then we're, we're still in the same spot that we were before. So we need to bridge these kind of opinions also and to address that. I call it the incentives for anybody in this sector to really see the value in participating in a pretty competitive, collaborative effort on, you know, first uh, discussing and then agreeing and then implementing a sort of approach to uh, a roadmap for the standards, for standardization. I don't want to use that word too much. Um, I would think that uh, we've seen in the last two, two days a lot of conversations uh, on many different subjects in our sector, but not many people talk about standardization. So I want to ask you, Melanie,
control a factory, you need to also have different layers of automation. And only these different layers of automation is, uh, is going to work if you have standardization. And these standards, it doesn't have to be that they send a new standards. That, 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 that basically, these standards all are already existing in other industries. So why would you not really use these standards to also implement in vertical farming or in general in indoor farming? Because these standards are not new. These are for basically uh, industrial uh, automation standards like CUA or other. Same an example in the car industry is that you have Cartena X. That is, that is a standard that basically all the devices, all the, all the automation in a car, doesn't matter if it's a car, they are communicating with each other. So that's, that's a standard that's being developed to standardize the whole industry. So, because it does not matter to uh, supplier A as standard X, uh, supplier B as standard Y. So uh, by looking to the industry, seeing actually the challenge of not having the data, we're basically saying, well, it is not an art, it's just you need to follow uh, a certain structure. And that is, in the end, uh, yeah, having standardization through your whole facility. Cool, cool. I mean, you know, there are two different views now from two different angles. I know in many cases we had uh, you know, discussions with uh, startups uh, who needed us to sign an NDA to even talk about anything. Kurt, do we need to really start thinking about standardizing NDAs? Before we even start talking about uh, uh, you know <coughs> anything, well, usually the source of NDAs is going to be the investors who are going to require a certain level of confidentiality. Of course, of course. Who are going to require a certain level of confidentiality of all the growers, whatever you know, the, the individual growers' motivations are. Um, you're going to be bound by the investors who have put millions of dollars in. Project. That's a reality that we have to face as far as what can be disclosed and what cannot. And as far as standardization, um, I ran into the same problems in, in my project uh, five or six years ago where we had a bunch of subsystems. I had a head grower who had two doctorates in plant sciences, so we were very, um, we had a high level of education uh, and desire to collect data, uh, but we had no way to organize all the data from all the subsystems. That was something that was very needed. But there's a bigger question before you even get to that, is what stage of development are all of you in the audience in? Because you first need, before you decide you want to collect data, you need to decide what do you wish to use the data for? How is it going to benefit you, number one? What type of data? you wish to get. And then you speak to experts to see what systems can we put in, what sensors can we put in to collect that data. That's really all the preliminary work you need as a, as a company before you can get to the issue of how do I, how do I create one standard platform where I can commute, where all that data can communicate to each other uh, without conflict. So there are stages to this process. And I just wanted to make that clear we all talked about this earlier today, we all agreed, but I just wanted to be able to say to you that what Rick is talking about to me is the next step, it's the logical step, there's a lot of opportunity to collect data out there, but you need to be able at some point to best use it, you're going to need to tie it into one platform. And I, I will plug Siemens, <laughs> even though Rick won't. Because a few weeks ago they announced a new product in the market. I don't know how good or not it is, but it's a it's a interactive platform that will tie in all your different subsystems of information. That's a trend that's happening in our industry. But you need to be at the stage to be able to use that at its best. And, and in that sense, yes, standardization is definitely the direction we need to go. Yeah, well, we, we, we agree on that, but I have had conversations with growers who actually differ on that because they, for whatever reason, feel that they know better what they do. And it's not necessarily that they want to divulge what they do. They just they say, well, then uh, my neighbor can do the same and, and I am hurting myself. So it's kind of like a mix between pride and trust. A lot, but you know, a lot of agriculture activities is not necessarily designed that it would work everywhere, right? It's one thing, yeah. It's also kind of 
dangerous assumption that you would hate, you know, anything in a biomimicry way. And even they try to touch a different outcome. It's interesting. But agriculture, by definition, is also something very individual. So the way entrepreneurial thinking is in agriculture is it's not manufacturing, unfortunately. For me, it's also how can we incentivize, or what ideas should we have for incentivizing a grower community to really see a value on actually doing this? You know, they want to learn from this. They, they all admit they want to actually achieve a better result. They want to earn more money. They may want to grow too. I mean, that's another question. Some, some farmers don't want to grow. They're just happy with their food. Right? So we need to take account of that. And the, the, I mean, what's the incentive? Why incentivize? Because you know, there's a lot of free information already out there. Uh, other industries show also how they do it better and how they scale it or whatever. Uh, I, I think in the end, the data is always owned by the, 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 the grower, right? So uh, the data that is coming out of your growth process, that's the value what you have. So it's, it's not the architecture, it's not the technology that is the value. The, the value is what is actually coming out of my growth process. So by having that information, then you create a value for yourself. <coughs> and what you do with this data, that is of course, that you can choose to give it or not give it or create a business model of it or maybe have a, a, an exchange with, with other companies. So there are a lot of possibilities. But I think to have the data, that's the first step that you need to create a system that is in, in general possible to have data. And then the second step is that you come decide what are you going to do with the data? But it's not a supplier that as the data, as the grower that is in control of this process. That, that's in the end how you see it also in factories. The factory owner has the data of the process. It's, it's the, not the technology architecture, they are open. So that's how we see it, is that uh, in, in, in industrial automation, you have more um, yeah, connected, yeah, you have an open platform, and in the end, you, you as the owner of your farm, or vertical farm, you can choose whatever you want to do with it. But if the farmer doesn't trust that, um, you know, how can you really provide trust to this? So the trust of not having data or have data? No, the, the trust would be guaranteed that he will not be losing his proprietary information, for instance, or but it's not going somewhere else. It's because he's, mm -hmm. he's owning his application. So I, I do understand that if somebody else is controlling your system, then but it's the same in the App Store. If you help it's an app. <coughs> Everybody knows what your app is doing, so you, yeah, there is, you need to have a certain trust in, in, a, in an ecosystem, in a partnership, and how, how you're doing and running your business model that, that it will scale in the end. And that's, of course, the whole idea of digitalization. Right. I mean, it makes sense to me, but uh, in my conversation with growers, we have a question. Well, so I think about in America, ranges and the tradition of of granges, they're able to talk about, well, what's the price you're getting per, per bushel? Or what are some of the insect pathogens that you're experiencing in your environment? So I'm wondering if there are any examples within the CEA community that are analogous to the traditional grange approach. It's interesting. Uh, can you describe the range a little more? Yeah, I mean, they're basically, so I grew up in a rural community, and then actually I live in an urban one now, but granges are still very active. So there are places where historically when the town was first built, it was one of the first buildings oh. that was built. And it's where farm families and the majority of the families in the United States who were farm families would gather outside of the church. It was the other place. And sometimes there was church on Sundays there too. And it, literally what I'm talking about, they would go and it was a way that they could actually fairly trade on the market. So it was one of the only ways that they would know what each other was getting price or bushel or pound or whatever it was that they were selling. It was also a way that they could then fairly negotiate for the supplies and materials that they needed. Because if somebody was being charged way more, they would hear about it at the range for way less. And oftentimes it was some sort of familial relationship that led to the price differentiation. And there was only one way that you could deal with that, and that was by talking to other farmers. And so I'm wondering if there's any kind of analogous Approach. Maybe it's in the EU, maybe it's not here in the United States, where that sort of... My own experience in the industry is unfortunately I don't see it. I think part of it is geography in the 
the sense that neighbors would come and meet because there were enough farmers in the community and the friendships and relationships were there and personal. You, you can have, and I work in the, in the greenhouse space, you can have you know, one greenhouse here and another one four hours away, there's gonna be very little personal interaction. Um, and if you talk about a community of greenhouses, you usually have to go beyond the state to talk about any sort of community of greenhouses. So the distance, the, 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 the span of distance, both socially and, and, and geographically, I think works against that idea, unfortunately, uh, in the US. You know, but, the, but there's a countervailing push, which is that every farmer, every grower, everyone who starts a project, no matter how well they're doing, they want to do better. They're reading in the market, well, someone so is claiming that they can do this. So there's that natural desire, okay, I, I achieved this this year, how do I get here next year? And that's where, if you can't get community information, you can get private information. And that's where we're talking about the, the benefit of more data. Your project can speak to you, and can speak to you in ways that will increase productivity. Uh, and I think there are tools coming down the pipe in the next year or two that are just starting to be on the market, like AI used correctly, that will transform your economics. Um, I have a client who is at the stage of building their own unified platform for their information systems. They then develop their own AI, and their production, just from their AI, increased from here to here, in less than a year, from the self-learning. This is a tool that all of you are gonna be able to have if you approach it carefully <coughs> in the stages you need to do. So although we may not be able to have the, the uh, advantage of an open information system, I believe with the tools coming available to each one of you, if you select them carefully, you'll be able to develop a very powerful, uh, helpful information engine for yourself. That's my view. Yeah, we're very really digitized. I mean, compared to the rest of agriculture, I mean, whatever precision ag, ag is doing is five percent is digital, the rest is analog. That's where it's from. But CEA is highly digital, but it's all these islands of digital uh, information share. And the grain is an interesting concept. It's basically a cooperative concept, uh, which is of course changing also because you know our agriculture is no longer regional, so even national, it's international, right? and it's also dependent upon the digital market. More and more, and that is also the interesting part about really seeing CEA not just what we are a niche, but seeing CEA also a, a transformer in the way you know a, a from seed to, to consumer how this could actually work in a, in a, in a more efficient way, resource efficiency, you know, better labor standards, better food safety, etc. We show this all, but but we don't demonstrate it. We don't bring it forward to actually. Uh, of it. Uh, I mean, that might be a frustration also for, for somebody like you to, to look at this and see, like, okay, there are all these interesting, uh, you know, islands of highly digitized uh, solutions which may be advanced or less advanced. But, yeah. yeah, definitely. So, yeah, uh, but it's also taking a while for, for all these companies to change. So, uh, I do see also that we need to have patience. But um, I think if you share, I think the biggest, the most important thing is collaboration. Collaboration with all the different companies and just opening up by, by, by working together, listening to the end customers, saying, okay, I would like to have more optimized production. One of the, and for example, with the AI, uh, labor is one of the most challenges in the world. So what if you would have data available of all these farms and make it more optimized and use AI to uh, reduce your labor cost? And yet, that's also how you can support it. Because if you have one, we should have data of one farm, that's nice. But if you have data of a thousand farms, then it's going to be really interesting because then you can really optimize the highest production in general. So <clears throat> I think indeed it is always affecting pure ways of, of, of farming <coughs> and general business models. 
where the potential was laying in front of us with data, with the power of AI, that will definitely move, that will go on, that will go further. You see also companies, big companies like Siemens or other companies, they are also with the power of open AI that is going into these markets, they will also make technology more uh, ready for this. So meaning that you, what can you do with data, how can you build up a whole technology stack by, by Optimizing industries, reducing energy, optimizing labor costs, etc. That's all possible with data. So there is a little importance to standardize and, and really subtract the data out of, out of these models. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, I'll just jump in and give some more reflective thoughts. Um, a couple things. Um, one is here, Rick and I were talking about earlier, and things that help with me sort of resonate um, is. Is I know when Thomas and I talked years ago, probably, and he came to plenty and said, you know, I'd really like to share your data. You know, the first response is, no way, um, I'm not going to share my data because, um, quite, quite honestly, um, Quincy is you know a, an evolving company, and it wasn't ready. I mean, the data was unrealistic and unrepresentative of a growing strategy, so it was not really useful to sell it uh, or to share it. So, so that's an interesting thing. Um, there, so there's some companies that are just too immature. They don't, you know, the data is not really valuable because it's it's too uh, kind of nascent. And but we were talking, like Rick pointed out, talking about the car industry. You know, we just, all of us have probably seen the car industry evolve, if you will. And I was using an analogy earlier today when we were chatting, you know, about you know most of us don't check our oil and, and tires as much as we maybe did 20 years ago when we went on a trip because we have the confidence in the sensors. We have the confidence in the systems to you know a little light will come on in our dashboard and works and then you know rick was telling me about the automotive you know there's all this underpinning of the computers that run our cars if you will and, and it came together so that it's all the same system so it's all standardized underneath there so yes i may prefer to buy you know a honda versus a mercedes versus a toyota or what or a ford but that's my personal choice but underneath it, there's a lot of similarity and a lot of standardization that is making those cars have um, similarities. So I think that, you know, you, you, we talk about data, but personally, as a plant scientist, I have almost zero interest in data. So maybe that's controversial to say. I really don't care about data. I care about the plants that come out and that I'm going to provide to my customer. That's what I want to do. And, you know, not just, you know, if it can be automatic, if it can be, you know, automatic, that would just be wonderful, but I have to be able to trust that. And I think that that's where we want to be. We know we've got to be there. And the last thing I'll say really quickly is we, um, gosh, 10 years ago, when um, LED lights were just chaos, uh, we had a meeting at the um, at American Society for Vertical Science that Eric Runkle called for. And we actually determined, like this group, to meet every year at that conference for an actual working session. Like, okay, let's. Let's actually start to do this together face to face and um, we've worked through a lot of the what was needed for standards in that industry and I think you know, now people can go and buy a light and compare it to a different light and understand what they're buying much more effectively. Um, so I think we could actually call for you know, a working group that meets every year at this conference even to like, you know, let's roll for a season and start to do this. You know, not in a panel like we're doing now, but in a, in a group of the interested parties to say, yeah, let's make this happen. Let's make it like the car industry. Let's guide and um, direct how we want our industry to grow effectively and efficiently using the most established places, you know, where they can provide some valuable data to create that standardization. And I'm talking again, greenhouses to vertical, whoever has growing strategies that are effective and moving forward. Because to me, a greenhouse is just a vertical farm which has variable light. I mean, you're still monitoring all these things for the output of the plants. So it's, it's, it's the same, same data, if you will. Okay, two cents. Well, thank you. I wanted to expand on that point, not just as far as communication within CEA, but for example, the National Grocers Association had their conference right next door. How many of you thought to go over there and see their exhibition? Yes. We all could have. Wow. Why aren't we? It's two different organizations that are so naturally uh, next to each other. Why don't we have meetings? Why aren't there um, 
seminars together, or ways to get to know each other and know more about each other. It's just not even thought of. Uh, but why it should be? I should be thinking about it uh, no, for many years now. And you know, the incentivizing topic is something that starts with retailers in some ways. Now, unfortunately, you know, when you look upstream, there is a bigger desire to kind of like look at the data than downstream for some reason. Because I guess produce is still not really that valuable in a in a retail context. It's growing. I mean, I think it's showing something interesting to Walmart. But you know, incentivizing uh, data sharing has also to do with it. If you do that, you want to get monetized for it as a grower. And for that, you need to have the retail category for it. Today, there's two categories in any retail. It's called conventional and organic. And CA doesn't exist. You can grow both conventional and organic produce in this uh, country uh, and be in that category, but that's it. And so you're in the same the same bucket like like any grower who grows anything differently uh, with the same product. But the incentive could essentially be a debate, or not a debate, a roadmap with the National Grocery Association to create a new CA category for us. They will be interested to talk to us about it. And we actually reach out to uh, retailers about it. And the, 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 uh, the question was uh, answered by yes, we will be interested if you organize it. So uh, let's call this uh, maybe also a working session for us here. Who would be interested to help organize this for next year's Interact? One, two. Okay, so we have a few souls here. Is that raising your hand now or am I scratching your head? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I mean, maybe that would be a good start to really do it because I, you know, Brian Sullivan from the uh, uh, Interact.com is actually sitting on our board, so we, our next board meeting will have one item on the agenda, which is like organize a working group with the National Grocery Association on the topic of standardization. Any other ideas about incentivizing? I mean, you know, the, this is the big issue, is in my view, that many conversations lead to many interesting thoughts, but then it ends there. And the moving of a, of a group grower to do something extra, even though the benefits are kind of logical for him, is taking a real clear intent. I think my question comes around accessibility. So in all of these things, the industry has grown so fast, and then so many amazing things, and applaud all the people at those levels that have the farms and the industry. Siemens might have, you know, is in Siemens and operating systems. So looking at that, I really applaud that. But my question is, Many different levels and growers. You know, when we talk about 
data accessibility uh, um, or other being integrated. So for us, it's also about collaborating with companies in the ecosystem. So uh, sharing our knowledge, but also working with all the companies out there that do, do this already. Um, then 100%, of course, you also need to make a schedule for yeah, other um, greenhouse uh, greenhouse owners or builders or um, yeah, that have less complex systems, of course. I think it's good that the vertical farming industry is now making important steps where the other industry will benefit from. Because it's always reinventing and we'll look at what is needed. And in the end, you will end up with a system what is scalable. Uh, and you don't need to have always a Ferrari. Maybe you need to have this uh, a Volkswagen or a different model. So you will have different models of automation. And that, that's, it will be modular. So if you have one greenhouse, or you have five or ten. It's just multiplying, multiplying your stack of automation. And that's basically the same in vertical farming. It's, it's only having a different an entry point. So the, our entry point is now, of course, but this actually will grow. But vertical farming yeah, was actually for us a really good use case to learn, okay, what is it, uh, how can we help the industry? But it's definitely going off to the greenhouse and the industry. So I'm convinced that it will happen. Anyone's related to that? I just want to give you an answer. Because where you were at Alan a few years ago, it's probably appropriate to do lots of hard work. But it's also, even, even for a big company, it, it's quite challenging because you have all these people and they are not, they, they, yeah, we are also learning how can we help these companies and how can we help these companies. So you, you, know, you have resources available and how can you like, make a solution what is really contributing to the industry. It does not make sense to make something. And that's also not part of how seamless it is the game, but it, it's really about helping with, with accessible solutions. That's that's not um, that's not that's not a strategy to make something totally different. It's just sharing the knowledge, and that's also about standardization. It's not having one brand. It's also having other brands. It is, but but as you need to do it together, and that's why collaboration again. That that's yeah. Also, how we are yeah saying, please come to us. We want to collaborate. We want to share knowledge. But alone, we can definitely not. Yeah, there's a bunch of questions here for the first half. But no, actually, did. you're back there. Back here. Yeah. Um, just a couple of uh, comments and questions. Uh, first of all, thank you all very much. Huge fan of the data. Um, CA seems to be lacking behind other industries as a whole as it relates to utilization of data integration. When you go into oil and gas, other manufacturing systems, You've got an entire platform that can tie into a PLC system between you know, labor operations, in this case, growth system irrigation, fertilization, lighting, electrical use, um, all the way to your packing line as it relates to weight, number of components, the whole process uh, contained in one system. Right now, every um, data company that I've talked to here at this conference, they can tie into an API system. Which is great. The problem with that is, is that I've got my own information system with my pack line. I've got my own labor system over here. I've got my own growth system over here. From an operational standpoint, I've got three separate individual systems. It's really nice to tie into an API that then gives me a, a common dashboard. And I've got to cross train all my folks into three different systems. So, number one is when you think the, the industry from a data standpoint is going to start to migrate towards best practices that we're already seeing in other legacy industries. So that's number one. And number two, from a cost standpoint, when it comes to data integration, most of us are in the process of growing and building 50, 100, 200, 300 grand to tie in all these different information systems becomes cost prohibitive. So when you start talking about the Ferrari versus the Volkswagen, right now for a lot of us, that data integration process is cost prohibitive. Uh, both from a tech standpoint, IT standpoint, and whether or not you're in Alaska trying to connect to the internet, some don't have access to cloud. So looking at cost parity as it relates to operational efficiency sometimes becomes a little bit cumbersome. Where is the industry going right now with, with using best practices with uh, other, other industries that's cost effective? 
Now we have obviously you know global uh, situation with CA actually happening in many different places. It's also a new phenomenon within agriculture. I mean yes, we had that with uh, synthetic uh, uh, fertilizers, etc. But I think the opportunity in the digital uh, integration is of course starting to really uh, be very much of an important uh, development, not only within the uh, ag community or the CA community. I mean, Every larger company, every government, <laughs> literally everything, wants every industry to be fully integratable. This is not only a, a demand or a, a reason to, to think about it, it's, it's actually unavoidable. Let's put it this way, right? No, I understand. But I, I think a nice example is our partnership with 80 Acres. Uh, the, the first point where they mentioned that we want to have one single pair of glass is that you want to have one operational system and not set up to control everything. This is, this is possible to do, uh, but of course, our gut again is coming not to us because it seems it has uh, the SCADA system, it's called SCADA, like uh, you have farm management systems, an operating system, what ties in every single element of your production, from seeding to growing, from harvesting to packaging, everything is being controlled about one operating system. That's basically what is it really typically being used in many industries. So if you want to even have this, you need to collaborate with all these different companies to have right from seven uh, screens to have all the data available in one screen. But even further, because if you want to change something in that operating system, you also need to interfere with the other systems. And that's not indeed you have a one-way API, it's nice to have data, but you actually need to have a two-way API, which also gives set points back because I want to have a higher temperature more water, so basically an automation stack where everything is integrated but also being operated from one single, single entry point. And that's where the industry is already is, but it could also be definitely implemented in the SCA space. So one more question that we have to kind of wrap it up. Uh, yeah, so when I think about data standardization or comparing different growing methods, one of the things that I always have trouble wrapping my brain around is comparing like, the performance of different irrigation strategies. You're trying to hold all as many parameters as possible the same so maybe substrate for volume for air conditions. Like can, can you just kind of give me some insight to how you think about uh, achieving like a, something of an actual comparison between different irrigation strategies? How you think about trying to compare performance of different irrigation strategies? Uh, there, you mean different irrigation strategies or uh, performance of uh, oh, you yield and quality just you know just benchmark yeah and how to benchmark between different irrigation strategies uh, so they need to have data available so uh, on the platform so if you have uh, all the data available that you can do on your on your class for example you could measure um, <laughs> what kind of techniques you do uh, and yes you with vision cameras or in general with data you can monitor your whole growth cycle right so I think that I think that for the platform that's, for example, a possibility in which uh, there are many, many different solutions on, on, on this strategy. But what we see uh, again is open platforms, and this sharing data, uh, also being the owner of the data. That's that's the most important part. Does that answer your question? Uh, I guess I guess if I'm thinking like if you're to compare uh, you know NFT and NFT flow, like is there a metric or a, a way of thinking uh, to compare those two, or do you kind of have to start from I mean, I think you're, you're asking a really good question. And I think, you know, I, 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 would, I would address you know, there's a couple things. We don't know exactly the answer. And I think this is where, you know, projects like the autonomous greenhouse projects that have happened, happened in about in the last three years. Um, there were a few cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, and then this year there were dwarf tomatoes. So looking at that data is very interesting, if that makes sense. Um, and then again, what, what you're asking, though, is kind of what I was calling where you know, you go to school and you're saying, okay, it's a deep water culture, it's an NFT, or it's aeroponics, which one's really the best? How do I want to create my farm and where do I get the data to give me that direction? So, and it's tricky um, because, you know, yeah, I can talk to you for hours about that, but it's tricky, it's a tricky answer. I think one of the things that is happening that's kind of exciting is um, in the United States, at least, and I'm really happy it's also in the Netherlands, you know, where there's four innovation centers where they are having Places that we build. There was a nice um, uh, 
Booth here from the Virginia Innovation Center, where they demonstrate different growing strategies, demonstrate different things that are of interest. I know there's a plan to build one in Pennsylvania and also in California, where it's not so much you know academic research presented here, but it's where we can have these demonstrations, we can have this applied research of comparing things like that in, a, in an open way where that data is available so that it's controlled, and again, this is what goes back to the autonomous greenhouse model of competitions where they had an on-site bargaining growers growing in the way that's traditional, and where they had multiple greenhouses side by side being grown competitively, autonomously. Um, so I think I would look for those, and I would demand those from, from, you know, from the USDA money, uh, some of the USDA talks, but that's something that should be done, and that's where I kind of was saying before that Basic research like that should not be done in companies. It's almost too time consuming, too expensive. Um, those kind of comparative studies, the irrigation strategies for high water crops, those can be done in the public domain. I think that data should be available and feed into the operating systems that can be developed and then keep feeding into stronger and stronger standardization. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, it sounds like it's a, it's a hard answer. To it's a hard <laughs> answer. But it's a very important one. I mean, one of the incentives, I think, could also be the, the, the use of these uh, innovation centers, what we call them in your own field labs, which is really actually demonstrating to the growers what works and, what, and how much it works and what, what are the differences. Right. And this is a public private domain and it's very applied. And I think this is something that, for instance, in the US market is really much needed huh? okay. to scale it. Here. And it could also really lead then also for a more open sharing uh, situation in that sense. You know, running out of time, I just wanted to close the panel by just quickly asking everybody from the panel to ask uh, the question, why? Why standards? Um, optimization, I think, and make it more efficient. So mass reduction, there are many, many advantages of, of the standards. So it, it, is, it is a, a way to uh, monetize. Resilience of industry, optimization, changing new business model opportunities, future. So, yeah. Emily? Yeah, I think, I think the reason for standardization is so we can actually grow the food, so we can actually address crop diversity and producing many more crops so we can need more people locally in Alaska and, and other small towns. Um, and so, yeah, we want to grow the food. We don't want to, we don't want to be inefficient about it and keep recreating the wheel and share the knowledge base that other people have. So, yeah, make progress faster. Great. Good. I can say it very easily. I think uh, standardization would do wonders towards making all of you more successful in your CEA endeavors. With that, I want to thank the panel. I want to thank you. Um, regarding the idea to have working session with the National Grocery Association, I will ask the organizers to put that on the website to get in touch uh, with us. Or you can also visit Farm Tech Society and send me an email. Appreciate it and a round of applause for these. And thank you very much, safe travels. Huh?